って。Thanks everyone for、uh, being here. We're really excited to share some early work from a project that、uh, we've been working on for almost a year now, actually.、Um, but today we're going to be talking about a project called Flush Pal and specifically how we're trying to introduce machine learning through a very, very playful, storytelling oriented activity、um, using plush toys and、um, toys that kids can bring to life using machine learning. So,、um, I wanted to say that、uh, this talk is going to be really informal. So, please, if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt us at any time and ask. And we're happy to answer.、Um, so, for a little bit of background, my name is Tiffany.、Uh, this work was developed during my time at the University of Tokyo, where I was a visiting researcher、uh, over the past year. And I have been collaborating on.、Uh, Doing, using Plush Pal, this、uh, tool to introduce machine learning、uh, through a series of workshops in collaboration with、uh, Yumiko, as well as our collaborators,、uh, Diana Gilosi and also Natalie Fee.、Um, Yumiko, do you want to introduce yourself or、uh, say sure, anything? Sure, sure.、Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yumiko. I think I've seen a couple of you before through LCL.、Um, I was a Postdoc in、uh, Lifelong Kindergarten Group for a couple of years in the past,、uh, working on LCL, like a、um, more recent versions of LCL. But、um, I have recently moved to、um, Canada, Vancouver,、um, where、um, I got the job as a system professor in Simon Fraser University. I'm a, a learning scientist and I'm very passionate about creative learning and bringing how to bring creative learning into classrooms. And so I Um, reconnected with Tiffany last year <clears throat> and then have been working with her, and it's been a really、uh, exciting journey. So I'm glad to share all of that with you. And、uh, yeah, as Tiffany mentioned, feel free to jump in and share anything that you were inspired. Great.、Hey, um, so y u m i k o and I are going kind of going to go back and forth、uh, across the presentation. Uh, but we wanted to start with an example of what Plush Pal looks like or what you can create with Plush Pal.、Um, so, we wanted to share a specific example created by our collaborator, Diana, to、uh, showcase her interactive pet. Let me introduce you to my pet dinosaur, Dino. Come here, Dino. Aw, that's really sweet, Dino. Are you feeling hungry? How? Aw, maybe you are a little bit hungry. How? Who's a good dinosaur? <laughs> Who's a good Dino? Yes, you are. Aw, you're so、How? sweet, Dino. Aw, you look a little tired, buddy. Aw. Yeah, time for a nap. <laughs> so, the way this is working more generally is that with Plush Pal, kids can decide on what gestures they want their stuffed animal to respond to. And then they can record their own series of sounds and use machine learning to train the computer to recognize those movements or those gestures、Let、and play the sounds when they're recognized. So,、um, stop, stop. so, you could see in this example that. Diana had her Plush Pal project respond to a lot of different types of gestures, from petting her、uh, dino to it jumping and skipping、um, to falling asleep. And so, what we're hoping to create is kind of this open ended environment for kids to imagine how their stuffed animals come to life and、uh, specifically have them respond to movement using sound.、Um, and this project kind of stemmed from、um, looking at the way that People currently prototype with hardware platforms. And one thing that I had kind of noticed is that if you look at tools like the Arduino or Little Bits or even the Micro Bit, a lot of projects that are built using these platforms are kind of crafted around the hardware. So, for example, with the Arduino, you might build like a box that hides all the wires that are connecting your Arduino to different sensors. Or if you're using Little Bits or other types of Platforms where you have lots of different modules, you might have to tape the modules to your creation or 
kind of design it so that you could hide hide them. Or even if the board is too big, it might be totally independent from your design, as you could see from the example on the right with the micro bit sitting on the side. And I think that this is a really, crafting with everyday materials is a really great way to be able to quickly go to prototypes. Um, but it looks very different than the types of toys that kids might already own. And I was interested in seeing what might happen if kids can turn their existing toys interactive. Does that provide a new play space where kids can take the toys they've already developed relationships with and actually bring them to life um, rather than creating more kind of disposable one-off prototypes. Um, so that led to kind of more generally thinking about what if kids could turn their existing toys interactive. So these were some initial sketches about kind of thinking through what that space might look like. And this isn't the first type of project, of course, built in the space. Um, so over the past decade, um, with the popularity, growing popularity of different types of computing, hardware computing platforms, we've seen a range of types of um, projects that have been around uh, bringing, uh, building interactive plus toys. Um, so one example, uh, if you go to the next slide, Yumiko, is uh, this project that came out of Mike Eisenberg's lab at uh, Boulder. It's about 10 years old now, um, but it was in the early days of the lily pad, which is a type of microcontroller that is sewable. So you can use it for, for wearable or soft projects um, where you want to build something that reacts to, for example, light or touch. Um, so this tool, Plush uh, Bot, let you actually design sewable patterns for plush toys. Um, and you can embed these lily pad components in them. Um, but building something like your own uh, plush toy using this tool would require a pretty significant amount of investment in time. So you would um, need to build your stuff animal from scratch. And you also need to have some familiarity with circuit design. How do these different ultron components connect together? And how do I sew them together to make my toy interactive? So the learning curve for something like this can be quite high. Um, another uh, project in this space is uh, a squeezy studio, which actually involves um, embedding conductive material into toys, but that requires you to cut open the toy, which can be somewhat traumatic or problematic if a kid really loves that toy. Um, so I was, uh, I think like non-destructive ways to be able to build these interactive toys can be a way for kids to be able to um, kind of embed and use toys that they already have without damaging them. And another project that kind of started to uh, move in this direction is actually one of my favorite research projects and really inspired uh, this project is one from uh, Keio University. Um, and it involves a ring that you can actually place around existing stuffed animals. So the ring has a series of motors in it. And uh, when, you, uh, when you use this ring, can you play the video? Uh, okay. uh, when you use the ring, you can actually program your stuffed animal to move back and forth. So you can attach it around, for example, the arm <clears throat> or the legs of a stuffed animal and get it to move, uh, which I thought was really playful. Um, but it's a little bit limited in the type of expression. So you can get your um, ar the arms to move back and forth, but that's that's kind of it. Like there's a pretty limited movement. So um, if you go to the next slide, um, generally what we were interested in trying to create is a system for kids to turn their existing stuffed animals interactive without damaging the toy. So how can we support a range of different types of stuffed animal sizes and shapes? Um, and we also wanted to explore the use of off-the-shelf hardware. So that last project we saw, Pinoki, it uses pretty specialized hardware. So it's not something that everyone could access. It's kind of a research lab project. So is there um, existing hardware platforms that we can use so that anyone can try this out with any stuffed animal that they have? And we also wanted to be able to support the range of ideas that kids might have for how they want their stuffed animal to respond to them through different types of movements. Um, and if you look at the way that existing programming tools um, support movement today, they're a little bit limited as well. So I know that uh, a lot of people mentioned that they use Scratch or they've been 
they were inspired um, or got to know one another through um, uh, being part of the Scratch community. And I think that Scratch and uh, MakeCode, for example, give really good starting points for people to build projects that respond to uh, movement. So these are two examples of programming blocks for the micro bit. Um, the micro bit, if, if people haven't used it before, is a little computer. Um, it costs around 15 US dollars and um, was distributed to all seventh graders in the UK where it was first uh, introduced and uh, designed. And it's now a really popular tool for people to uh, experiment with physical computing. So they can program, um, build different projects that respond to the sensors on a micro bit. And if you look at the ways that you can have the micro bit respond to motion in these other programming tools, um, often the, the types of movement that you can respond to are kind of set defaults. So in Scratch, for example, you can program your project to respond to when the micro bit moves or when you shake the micro bit or if you jump. Um, but there isn't a lot of options beyond that. And um, uh, sorry, if you go to the next slide, um, if you are used to programming in these types of environments, often there's kind of like a thresholding idea. So you might look at, for example, if you're tilting the stuffed animal and have the uh, project respond based on how much you tilt. Um, but if you're trying to get the um, micro bit or other types of hardware to respond to more kind of fluid or expressive movement, uh, next slide, uh, for example, when the stuffed animal is doing kudo dancing, that's not as straightforward of a programming exercise because getting the computer to understand complex movement like that is a little bit more complicated than a single threshold, like saying, if I move all the way to the left by 50 or some amount. So um, one way to approach that is to use machine learning. So machine learning lets you essentially um, train a computer using data. So you can show it lots of examples of a certain type of movement. And then the computer using the machine learning model can start to develop an understanding or start to um, kind of determine different patterns that let it distinguish between different types of movement. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, what we do in PlushPal um, is we enable kids to be able to record different examples of different types of movement, different types of gestures. And the machine learning model that can uh, distinguish between them using kind of like a probabilistic model. So with machine learning, you're kind of, um, the computer is taking a guess at what the closest um, example is that it's already seen um, compared to live sensor data. So um, as you're then testing out your machine learning model, you can see what is the computer thinking I'm doing right now. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, the micro bit is a core part of the PlushPal project uh, or how it works. So um, PlushPal is using the sensors on the micro bit to be able to detect movement and specifically using the accelerometer, um, which is a sensor that is embedded on the micro bit to detect how it's moved in three different directions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but in order for that to be securely um, attached to the kids' stuffed animals, we designed this little backpack. Um, so uh, we have kind of paper templates if kids want to design it from um, cardboard or using like a cracker box or a cereal box, um, or you can sew it. And um, we've also had kids in workshops just use a rubber band directly to attach it to the plus toys. Um, and then once you've attached the stuffed animal or the um, micro bit to the stuffed animal, you download a uh, program onto it um, in order for it to stream its accelerometer information to the PlushPal app. Um, so there are kind of three steps to using PlushPal. Um, so the first step is to record your gesture samples. Um, so when you record the samples, you basically perform whatever gesture you want the computer to recognize, and it will do it, uh, give you two seconds to record that sample. Uh, you could go ahead and play it. So here I'm recording a gesture sample of clapping. And right after you record excuse the sample, me, uh, yeah. excuse me for a moment, Tiffany. Uh, some of our 
of the participants can't hear you very well. We have some oh, okay. audio issues here. Could you okay, please try to speak, uh, speak a little louder and slower, please? Okay, sure. Please. <clears throat> thank, okay. thank you. Thank you. No problem. Um, so, um, yeah, so you can record two seconds of a sample. And then for any um, gesture that you're adding, you can add as many samples as you want. And that sample size is actually a pretty important idea about machine learning that you need to provide a good number of samples for the computer to be able to draw from when it's trying to predict what you're doing. Um, if you go to the next slide, um, after you add your gesture samples, you can then record um, what you want the uh, stuffed animal to respond to. It. So you can record your own sound. Hi, I'm Froggy and I like to exercise. Um, and once you record the sounds, you can connect them to the gestures that you've added. So on the right, you'll see that there is essentially a section in the interface called triggers. And you can, uh, for any given gesture, like waving or doing jumpy jacks, you can connect it to the sound that you've recorded. Uh, next. Hi. And then finally, um, on the left, there's essentially a console where you can see what the computer is um, guessing is the closest gesture. So uh, if you play the video, um, as you're testing your design, it's basically uh, Hi, kind of and like to making a prediction as you're moving your stuffed Jump animal. One, two. And then whenever any of those gestures are recognized, then it will play the sound that you've um, defined. So, Throughout building a PlushPath project, you kind of um, go back and forth between these three steps, recording a sample, um, so essentially recording data for the computer to be able to draw from when it's making its predictions, recording sounds, and then evaluating your design. Uh, next. So um, we really wanted to be able to support lots of different types of gestures, but we were also interested in understanding if we give this tool to kids, what are the types of gestures that they would come up with on their own? And so uh, we ended up running a series of workshops around using PushPal. Um, next. Uh, if you are interested in the details of how this is implemented, I'm happy to talk through it, but I'll kind of go through this slide pretty quickly. Um, but essentially, this is a type of machine learning model called a supervised machine learning model. And what that means is that you give the machine learning model a series of samples that are labeled. So in this example, um, when you create a new gesture, the label is the name of the gesture, so clapping or stretching. And then you give it lots of examples so that it can use it to um, be able to predict what it sees when you are performing the gesture in real time. Um, and it's using this um, algorithm called dynamic time warping that is a little less sensitive to differences in speed. So for example, if I collapse more slowly than the samples I've recorded, it would be able to account for that. And it's again, uh, using the cell rometer on the microchip. Uh, so I'm gonna pass it over to you will go to talk a little bit about some of the workshops that we did around PlushPal. So um, as um, Tiffany explained earlier, um, we were um, excited to um, try it with the uh, children. But before going into that, we started by um, uh, testing it with some of the educator group that we were connected with. So we uh, ran a two workshop with uh, two groups of educators explore um, educators from Exploratorium in uh, San Francisco, US, and also a group of teachers um, that I've been working with from Japan. And um, <clears throat> we asked them, because of this COVID situation, of course, the workshop were held online. And then uh, we asked them to bring uh, their own uh, stuffed animals and micro bit. And then um, workshops was pretty simple and uh, short, uh, only a one hour long. And then uh, we walked them through um, the system briefly and then um, brainstormed and just did a 15 minutes of building projects. 
Um, through this workshop, uh, we learned a lot of things, um, including a lot of troubleshooting for the system. But um, big takeaway from that workshop was um, many of the, uh, we started by uh, doing a brainstorming of what kind of gestures they would want uh, their stuffed animal to have, to be able to do, what kind of things they can do. And then uh, moved on to the um, introducing Flash Pal. Um, but we noticed that um, without knowing uh, how the Flash Pal works, oftentimes they're, they're um, brainstorming and, and uh, what they can actually do um, was a little bit disconnected so that um, many people had a difficulty um, understanding what um, they what they can uh, sense in using the system of Flashpal. Um, so we decided to, uh, for the children, we decided to sort of introduce a little bit of the ideas of machine learning, how the Flashpal platform works. Um, and, and we also got a lot of um, good, um, unique ideas about uh, kind of things they can do uh, with the, um, platform or the possible things that they, they are thinking about. Um, one, um, one of the ideas that we got, got from them was, oh, maybe I, I should um, play the video first. So I will show some examples from that workshop that came out. This is the uh, one educator from Exploratorium. Um, he used, um, he actually created the stuffed animals out of socks and uh, created this work. A DIY stuffed animal that could go with me on a, a trip in my luggage. So here's what it does when it goes into the suitcase. Where are we going? It asks where we're going, and then in case things get a little bit rocky during the flight, it gets scared. Oh no, turbulence! Where are we going? And then after the flight is over, we take him out of the bag. And so he's a, another little friend that will be there uh, anywhere you fly to and can uh, keep you company on a, on a long journey. Where are we going? A DIY. And his example was really great. Um, uh, ones with a lot of sort of connected stories behind it, uh, contextualized in uh, his travel buddy. Um, this is another example from an educator from Japan. He also created the bow. Um, bow. So he was uh, um, uh, recording so like a uh, series back. of activities. Hello. Bye bye. Bye bye. Goodbye. And like, turning back. <laughs> and surprise, surprise and jump off. Wow. 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 He's happy, like he feels a little um, happy feelings. And so these are just a few of the examples, but um, we had a really interesting conversation about um, how um, different types of stuff, the animals inspire different creative ideas. Um, one of the educators from Japan um, didn't have any stuffed animals. So he brought a cushion for his back that he uses on his chair um, as, a, as, a, as, a, um, as a stuffed animal to work with. And then so he had a very creative idea. And then other educators suggested that when stuffed animal is something that exists in the world, for example, like bear or horse, you tend to be want to sort of do what the real animal would do um, but when it's something completely different or it doesn't is not uh, actual uh, living things you tend to be able to think about a little bit um, more um, creative ideas around it um, <clears throat> other people also have um, um, some other ideas like um, 
using those uh, stuffed animals to do a little bit more longer term, uh, longer sound, like uh, running around and wants the sound to continue. And so um, some of the um, participants were trying to figure that out he as also well. Created so the... I'm gonna um, move to Bye. the different ones. I, I think we are. So um, from uh, this uh, experience with educators, we got a lot of um, inputs from um, educators. And then um, we decided to move on to trying it with some of the children's. And then uh, we, uh, in, those, um, in those sessions with children, we decided to focus on two research questions. One of them, how do children bring their stuffed animals to life using gestures. And here we were really generally interested in how uh, when the children has this power um, to um, make their stuffed animals to life, what are the ways that they can do, what, what are the ways they can engage with it? What are the ideas they, they come up with? And the second research question is how did children engage with data science practices with building their ML model with PlashPal? And um, there are a lot of, lot of recent work around uh, engaging children with machine learning and then trying to teach them the concept. But um, there are a few, very few examples that uh, uh, like PlashPal where uh, we can introduce machine learning uh, through play, through engaging with uh, their own dearest stuffed animals. So what are the ways this kind of activities with this kind of experiences can contribute their understanding, their relationship with machine learning? So that was the uh, first, second uh, questions that we wanted to um, explore. Um, Tiffany, would you like to take over from here? Sure. Yeah. So after we did the two pilot workshops with teachers, we then uh, tried it out with kids and we worked with kids between the ages of um, eight and 14 years old. And we did a mix of online workshops and in-person workshops. So um, for some of the workshops that involved um, kids in uh, North America, where a lot of the schools were shut down. We did remote workshops. Um, in Japan, uh, the kids were actually going to school um, safely. So uh, we were able to do one-on-one -on -one sessions um, with kids. And so we wanted to share a bit about uh, kind of the structure of that activity and what we learned from it. So um, of these uh, kids that participated in the workshop, Actually, eight of the 11 kids had never used the micro bit before. So um, kind of machine learning was very new to the kids, but um, the micro bit was also new. So we started this activity by first just introducing what the micro bit is and how it can sense motion. Um, so if you go to the next slide, uh, we start off by having them just connect the micro bit to Plush Pal and move their stuffed animal around. So they start to see like um, that the movement can be detected by the computer. And that um, if you look at the plot on the top of this uh, graphic, there's kind of like three lines. It's a little bit hard to see because of the contrast, but like uh, there are three different colored lines and we ask them to try moving the stuff in more around and see if they can move the different colored lines. Um, and so uh, for the next slide, um, this kind of, leads into us talking about how what we see with our eyes is very different than what the computer sees. So we can see, for example, that an arm is moving, but the computer doesn't really have a sense of what exactly, what exact part of the stuffed animal might be moving. Um, it just knows how the sensor is detecting the motion. So we use that to kind of then talk about the accelerometer really briefly as this component that can detect movement in three different directions. So that's why there's these three colored lines in the chart um, when you see what's coming out of the accelerometer. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, next. So uh, then we kind of talk about machine learning, this idea that they're going to be able to show the computer different examples of movements and that the machine will 
uh, the computer will use machine learning to be able to detect them and make them make it possible for them to build their interactive projects to respond to these movements that they've uh, defined. Next. Um, and so you have touched on this before, um, we decided in these activities to start with a guided activity where we have everyone create the same project just so they get familiar with the tool before they brainstorm their own custom gestures that they want their project to use. So in this starter project, we have all of them um, create examples for none, jump, and running. And we selected those um, movements or those gestures because it can be used for any stuffed animal, regardless of whether it has arms that can move or not. Um, so they each created three samples of each of these gestures and then tested it out by then uh, next uh, recording their own sounds and having the computer respond to either jumping or running by playing the sounds that they recorded. Um, next, so, so at that point, we then actually have them brainstorm their own idea for a project and we created a character worksheet that they filled out. So we had, had them kind of describe the personality of their stuffed animal and what they like to do or where they might like to be during the day. And then they come up with a series of three gestures and sounds. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. Um, they answered these um, questions about the activities that stuff they wants to do. And then they use this combination of gestures and sounds in their project. So we asked them to come up with ideas for the gestures they wanted to add. And then they um, could use that within their plush pal project. So uh, then once they've done the brainstorming activity, we gave them 20 minutes to build out their idea using the tool. And uh, during the project, we then, uh, if you go to the next slide. During this uh, activity, we collected a few um, different types of data to try to understand how to support kids in this process. So uh, we had a pre and post workshop survey that just asked them generally about their experience, maybe using some technologies that uh, use machine learning, like voice assistants, like Siri, for example, and also what they think machine learning might be. Um, we also recorded video and screen recordings of how they built their projects and um, had some data analytics built into the tool. So we can build, for example, these plots that show how they were adjusting the machine learning model over time. So you can see an example on the bottom that there were four different gestures used in this particular project, playing board games, sleeping, and dancing. And you can see over time that um, the child added samples for each of those gestures. Um, so the y-axis is the number of samples. So she added three samples for each of these gestures. Um, but throughout the process, or for when she was building this project, she actually didn't ever have to go back and remove samples or re-add samples based on how the model was performing. Whereas you can see at the top, it's a very different example where there are a lot of gestures and she's kind of going back and forth and removing and adding uh, samples as she's building a project and testing it. So um, uh, next slide. So uh, we had the kids bring in any stuffed animal they wanted to use for a workshop. So we had a range of different types of stuffed animals uh, I believe six of them ended up being teddy bears um, and eight of them had posable arms. So they had like arms and legs that can move independently. And I want to just start with a few examples of what kids made. Uh, so this is an example of a bear at a cafe. Hi, my name is Brian. Excuse me, I'm ready to order. Nice meeting you. Yeah. <laughs> so when she was describing how she came up with these ideas, she was saying how she wanted to think about what she would do at a cafe if she was meeting a friend. So she kind of imagined the scenario of the bear meeting a friend at a cafe and what gestures they might do um, in that setting. Um, this next example is of, uh, based on a girl's pet bunny. So she brought a bunny shaped stuffed animal and was able to pick her gestures based on the types of activities that she sees her body do. 
is a project of our buddy. Well, <laughs> he likes to jump in the grass and then roll. He likes to lie down and snore. I was very impressed in this example of her snoring. It's very accurate. <laughs> she, she recorded all of, all of her sounds herself. Um, and in this last example, um, the setting that this child picked was actually Disneyland. Um, so she kind of imagined the different types of activities that a bear might do when they're visiting an amusement park. Uh, so teacup is like when you're on a teacup ride. Um, and Yumiko actually can probably help translate exactly what the last sound was. Yeah, the last sound was he, she was like, a, um, the I'm feeling dizzy was like what she was saying. <laughs> Um, so those are just a few examples and uh, yeah, keep in mind that these are examples that were created over the course of 20 minutes, so pretty short activity, um, but we looked at the different types of gestures that kids created and in total there were actually 42 unique gestures across the 11 kids projects and the most top popular type of gesture was gestures related to exercising, so a lot of um, really uh, kind of like um, physical activity type gestures um, incorporated into projects, including things like um, jumping jacks or practicing soccer or swimming. Um, and the other activities or other types of categories, if you go to the next slide, include things like routines and play and recreation. Um, so we started to see that a lot of these types of um, gestures that kids were incorporating just generally involved play and, and uh, exercising. Uh, next. Uh, so um, we had a pre and post survey to ask kids um, just generally questions of, about machine learning or what they think machine learning might be. And we didn't expect anyone to have any experience with machine learning going into this workshop, but we kind of wanted to see how their thoughts about what machine learning that phrase might evoke might change from before and after the workshop. So um, initially when kids answered this question of what do you think when you hear the term machine learning, um, their responses actually um, had to do with humans learning with technology. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, some of the responses included statements like, using machines to help learn, help us learn, aid in the learning process, or uh, learning what a machine is and how to program stuff. And this general idea of um, machine learning as programming was um, pretty common in the responses more generally. Um, but when we looked at the responses to the same question after that activity, um, uh, next slide, we found that uh, most of the children were actually able to describe machine learning as this idea of machines learning, so computers learning rather than humans learning. Um, so they used phrases like coding using memory or machines learning from past experience. And um, given that this was such a short activity, I think this is a really promising start to kind of introduce this idea of just generally computers learning from data. Um, I know we have kind of limited time, so I think I might just talk about a few um, kind of key takeaways from what we saw in terms of kids debugging their machine learning model um, as it became a way for us to generally understand what type of data science practices kids were engaging with as they were building their projects. Um, and we saw kind of these two different practices for considering how to create samples or thinking about similarities across gesture samples. Um, so uh, next, in this uh, first approach, um, which most kids followed, they added very similar examples. And what I, what I mean when I say similar is that 
the samples are consistent with one another. So um, they tried to uh, remove samples or re-record samples when they saw that the graphs did not look very similar to one another. So this is kind of an example of a video um, showing what that looked like. Uh, next slide. So you'll see here that the kid is uh, recording some gesture samples for kicking a soccer ball. And uh, uh, you'll see how he tries to create really similar examples. It's kind of very different. Mm. I might delete that. Okay. Uh, so you can see how uh, if he finds something doesn't look quite right, he will remove a sample and re-record it. Okay, more like it. And then uh, so this example one, is two, three jumps. recording another sample of jumping. Boing. So he kind of looks at the graph and kind of traces it to see how many times did I jump previously? And then he counts when he's jumping to show that he's trying to make it as close as possible. Um, but we also saw this uh, very interesting second approach um, where the child actually captured very different looking samples in an effort to get the computer to recognize multiple different types of poses with the same label. So in this example, she is recording samples of sleeping. And you'll see that she actually intentionally changes it a bit because sleeping might not always look the same. Um, so you can show the next video. Let me make it really quick. So you'll see in this example, she first records a sample where the stuff in was sleeping on his back. And then she moves it to one side and then to the other side as if the bear's like tossing and turning in bed. Okay, that's good. And this is something um, that we saw across a bunch of her gesture samples. So like you'll see here when the bear is waving, she has it move back and forth really quickly for her first sample. And then she has it move a little bit and then stop. Um, so she's changing it every time that she records her sample. No. I noticed that when you're um, adding the different gestures or the samples, you're, make, you're doing something a little bit different each time. Can you talk a little bit about? Yeah, I, I was doing that like a little, because like when I was sleeping like this, I did that and maybe it's mm -hmm. making me move side to side. Like, so it sometimes stays and sometimes goes. Mm -hmm. like, so it would recognize all of it. Cool. Um, so sorry, I thought I had included the subtitle video, but I do have the, the quote from it on the next slide. So her response to our question about um, why she changes her samples each time, she said she wants the computer to recognize all of it. So you can see here on the right, these three different gesture uh, sample plots for sleeping where the bears uh, still and then moving to one side and the other. And this is actually a pretty common practice when you think about machine learning models when you have lots of data. So you don't want the data, you want the data to be representative of lots of different cases. Um, but it becomes a bit of a challenge actually when you're using um, machine learning models that have just a, a few samples. So in most of the cases, the kids were only recording about three samples for any given gesture. And when you only have one that's representative of that movement, that can be a little bit challenging. So um, it's something to kind of consider as we're developing the project and more generally for other machine learning platforms. How do you kind of like um, balance that, that idea of trying to create um, lots of different samples that can generalize and how do you think about consistency so that the computer has an easier time kind of um, making its decisions or making its predictions. So uh, we go to the next slide. 
Um, hmm. I think that I'll just very quickly talk about the next one and then we can end with um, some of the future work around it. So I'll skip the sample size because I kind of talked about that already. Um, but generally, um, playing around with the building machine learning models and debugging them actually gave some really interesting opportunities to think about what the computer can or cannot sense. Um, and so we had um, some really interesting observations where kids realize when they were doing very different things that they want, um, that the, than the gesture they wanted the computer to understand, that the computer would incorrectly predict some movements. And um, some of the videos that uh, preceded this slide kind of had to do with that. Um, and for the interest of time, I guess we'll skip that. But um, some of the kids also described how they felt that the micro bit might be able to detect how they move their arms in particular ways, um, or how they um, move the limbs of their stuffed animals. And I think that there are lots of opportunities to use machine learning as a way for kids to be able to experiment with what can the cell number sense and what can it not sense. Um, uh, I think you can go to the next slide. So I, I think I'll skip the sample size and maybe just um, go straight into uh, some of the things that we're trying to explore next. Yumiko, do you want to talk about this? Yeah. So just to briefly, um, one of the things that we were uh, very got curious about based on the experience that we had with uh, some of the children in the workshop was like, how can, um, how can this kind of tool might be able to support the storytelling of children, um, young and old? So um, we started to thinking about um, different types of workshop that um, can really focus focuses on the storytelling of participants. And so right now we are planning to um, test it with a, a educator group um, to um, try some of this uh, different types of storytelling workshop. So we started, uh, we have a, we are sort of in the brainstorming stage where like maybe we can try some of the sort of idea card where you pick one of the card and then create a story around that um, card that you picked or you pick a Pokemon card and then uh, create, a, create a, a gestures around the abilities that you found on the card or maybe a Mad Lib style uh, where you put the um, adjectives or names into the um, sort of um, empty uh, empty boxes in a sentence and then create a gestures uh, around it. Or another idea is like start with the uh, existing stories and maybe uh, think about the different endings uh, for the uh, very commonly known stories. And I just uh, briefly, I wanna show uh, one of the examples that um, our collaborator Natalie created that maybe we could also do a puppetry um, experience, um, especially in this case, um, using the sort of Zoom screen uh, by, um, she, she, and then she created the sample videos um, using this. Once upon it's a, a time, story a about frog the frog and the scopian. Hey, frog buddy, can you give me a ride to the other side? Now, how do I know you won't just sting me? I wouldn't do that. We'd both drown. You see, I cannot swim. Okay, then. Let's go. So the frog jumped into the water. That was one gesture. And then Scopion swimming is another gesture. Scopion Why would you do that? Is another gesture. So she created this um, ex example. So like provide the story, well, also well-known story to the people and then um, sort of reacting it um, in the puppetry style using the um, flash bell environment. So we are still sort of brainstorming and trying to figure out which one might be the uh, most interesting ones, but um, we're hoping to um, host this and uh, try out different types of storytelling workshop and then try it with uh, children. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, Plush Pal is free for anyone to try out. Um, you will need to have a micro bit to uh, use it. 
but um, all the instructions are available on this uh, through this URL. And um, on the left side, there's a link to a guide that has kind of more in-depth instructions for how to get started and um, what to try out. But if you do get a chance to try it out, feel free to contact myself or Unico. Uh, we'd love to kind of hear how, um, if you have any suggestions or if you create anything um, interesting with it, uh, we'd love to see as well. So uh, we are happy to take any questions that you might have and thanks so much for listening. We have lots of questions. Okay. But... <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. I'm sure that we have a lot of questions. Um, so uh, there are people that join us, has joined us during the presentation. Um, but are not in, on the video home. But we can also read their questions if they want to make it on the chat. We are available for that too. So for people that <laughs> are already here, let's start. Adele, the first one to join us today. <laughs> And the first to suggest the artificial intelligence in education series on the global education community. Please, Adele. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I really, really love the, the, the product. The first reason, because my uh, I, I love uh, working with uh, Arduino and um, this kind of boards. Lately, I was working with the ESP32 board. And the second thing is that I have a big interest on artificial intelligence and how to combine uh, uh, IoT and uh, uh, AI. So for me, this project is a really an amazing uh, project I, and I really, really love it and I would love to, to try. So I just have some questions. So my qu first question is, do you think to, to, to extend your project to more boards, for example, ESP32? or even a mobile phone, for example, with MIT App Inventor, because I imagine uh, your platform is amazing and it can uh, get data from, I, I expect, beside the micro bit, it can get, get data from any uh, other devices. So I think if you add uh, beside micro bit, for example, MIT App Inventor or other boards with uh, accelerometer uh, sensor and orientation sensor, I think we, we uh, a lot of people, more people, they will uh, be using your your your, your amazing uh, work. So this is my first uh, question. Uh, the second point was also about how many sample do you need? Uh, example, do you need to feed your model? By my experience with the students, uh, in the beginning they are excited about uh, making the examples, but when you need a lot of examples. It starts to be boring in the in yeah. the workshop. I don't know if you had this experience with the students. Yeah, uh, I have a lot of a lot of thoughts about your question. Thanks so much for the feedback. Um, so for your first question about using other devices, at this point we are um, very much focused on the micro bit, mostly because actually when I started the first project, I was um, or when I first started the project, I was actually designing custom hardware and then of course COVID happened and I was no longer able to use a shop and I kind of rethought the project to try to think about is there a way to use hardware that more people have and a big part of this project is also kind of thinking about like the aesthetic considerations and so um, at the beginning of the presentation we're kind of talking about how um, attaching hardware to existing objects, existing toys is kind of complicated right now. And I think that the micro bit is, is kind of nice in its size and affordability and also um, its ability to attach to stuffed animals because of everything being built into that single board versus like an Arduino where you might have an ESP, like even if you have like a wireless um, capabilities for the Arduino, you might have to, for example, add additional mm -hmm. sensors or um, I think like having it all kind of be part of the same um, platform is 
a really nice way to make it a little bit easier to aesthetically like attach to stuffed animals um, easily through the backpack. And so um, I think adding um, capability for other devices would be a really interesting direction to take the project. Um, and at this point, we're really just uh, kind of using the micro bit as a starting point because it's had so much popularity, especially among the young audiences that we see being a particularly good fit for this type of storytelling activity with plush toys. Um, and then for your second question about data sampling, um, so for dynamic time warping, the algorithm that I mentioned that we're using, um, another reason we picked it is because it doesn't require that many samples. So if you look at something like teachable machines, for example, you might have to record samples like at least eight times for audio samples and then for images, you want many more. Um, and so dynamic time warping is really nice because we found that, for example, if you have a series of three gestures in a project, you can have three samples and it work actually fairly well. Um, but it depends on so many different factors, for example, whether the gestures themselves are distinct from one another. Um, but we have found that having three, three samples, um, it has worked quite well for um, projects with three different gestures. And you know, when you start adding more, then you have to start thinking about adding more data samples. But we've never had people add more than like five or six. And so um, that has been um, a really nice way for us to get people started quickly. And one of the things I've actually wanted to do in our next series of workshops is have people kind of rate like how engaging they find different parts of the process from um, recording their sound to like recording samples to testing their design. Because I was also kind of concerned like if you have to add like 10 samples and repeat the process over and over, that might not be super exciting to young kids. And um, I we haven't like actually asked them directly like which parts of the process are you most in, um, engaged in or like, interested in. And I think if we start to do that, we might get a sense. Um, but I do think dynamic type of thing has helped us in not requiring too many samples for people to get started. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for those questions. Okay, Mohana, would you like to ask something? Yeah, sure. I mean, I have lots of questions, but I'll just begin with one. And first of all, thank you, Tiffany and, um, you know, uh, Yumiko for this amazing presentation and sharing your research with all of us. And thanks to Helosa for organizing this. My first question is like, uh, I uh, like there are lots of things going on, like your research is with eight to 14 years, I see, and people are giving inputs, like how can we train the machine, right? in terms of machine learning. Uh, I want to ask a question about the emotional connection between a toy and a baby, like at different ages. So like I have a one year old and I see him when in this time of pandemic, he's like locked down at home, he's all the time playing with iRobot, like the Roomba, which is a vacuum cleaner, you know? And, and then he's trying to dismantle it. He wants the machine, the robot to kind of go past an obstacle and do all the stuff he wants. So, but you know, he's very upset when the, the, when the machine, the robot doesn't listen to him. So there, <laughs> like after a while, like your goal, I just want to know the bigger picture. Like, you know, when you are thinking of training the machine to kind of, you know, record sound and react to the baby, like how he or she wants them to, you know, behave like a bunny taking a snore or something. So at one point of time, when you want the machine to learn and give back to the kid, at what level would you think the emotional connection would work? And when will a kid know that, oh no, this the machine cannot do and what should I do next? Like, what are you thinking about it? Yeah, so um, I would say that the 14 year old was a bit of an outlier actually. So like, for example, um, for that activity that we did um, with the it, it, kids in person, most of the kids were between eight and 10 years old. And we picked that AIDS level mostly because um, the micro bit is kind of designed for middle school age youth. So we're already kind of working with kids quite younger than that. Um, but we kind of wanted to see like what age might be appropriate for this type of storytelling activity where kids still have kind of like a strong emotional connection to their stuffed toys and may also be engaged with imaginary play with their stuffed toys. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I think that skews a little bit younger than the micro bit, which, you know, at middle school age, kids might not be engaged with their stuffed animals in that same way. And so that's something actually we're still kind of actively teasing out. Um, we haven't tested with any kids younger than seven years old at this point. Um, and a lot of that has to do with kind of the design of the tool itself, that there's, you know, this web interface for it. And like, there's some like kind of um, language requirements for like, being comfortable with using the keyboard and so like there are some parts of that process that we think um makes it a little bit easier just from like an ergonomic standpoint there's nothing to do with like kind of like the emotional um connection but i do think that um in thinking about the storytelling activity this thing that uh, unico was mentioning and we really wanted to just kind of like scaffold that narrative process and i think that's something that we could do potentially with younger kids even like pairing with older kids that might be more familiar with like using the computer and like um, being able to navigate the interface. So that could be like an interesting way to try to get the um, input and ideas of even younger kids. But Yumiko, do you have any thoughts about this? No, yeah, I was, we were, um, we were thinking, we were, uh, I was reflecting on uh, how we, we also talked about how different aged kids re respond to um, stuffed animals and almost like middle school kids who are almost like intentionally disconnecting themselves from those uh, uh, stuffed animals. Some of our participants said like, I was just given this stuffed animal from my parent or something like that, because like they, they were like, they, they sort of like wanted to show that they don't play with stuffed animals anymore, or something like that. So we are very, um, but, but I think it's very interesting to us that how, when the student uh, participants have actual emotional attachment to the something, and if they can turn that into something more interactive to them, to them, what would happen? And that's, I think, where the real contribution of tool like Plush Pal might be, um, might surface. And so, yeah, we are very excited to explore that a little bit um, once we figure out the, how can we support those um, uh, children in that those younger age um, to handle the platform. So yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you so much. Um, oh, uh, excuse me, uh, some people have joined us, us um, including Liu Zhengji. Maybe Tiffany uh, already know him. Uh, he's from Taiwan, a microbit specialist. Awesome. Please. see you. Hello, everyone. I come from Taiwan. I live in Taiwan, uh, Miaoli. Thanks. Nice meeting you. Great. Nice to meet you. Uh, Tiffany, he mentioned me during the week that you have talked to him about microbit. You find oh. him to ask him oh, something. Are you the do you remember? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I guess yeah so. This is a surprise for you. I'm so happy he could make it because yeah. he has another uh, appointment and now he finally come. So thanks for oh, coming. I think, yeah, I, I, I believe we might have had a discussion about like the audio support for yes, the MP3. Yeah, thank you so much for answering my questions. It's really great to meet you. Okay. I, uh, oh, yeah. Inspired by a lot of your microbit projects. Thank you. And also, we have Simon Mong. He is from China. So, Wang King, our good friend from 2013, who first took out the L cell with us, uh, he's from South Korea. And also, Simon Rodriguez uh, from Mexico. So welcome everybody. And also our good friend, uh, Roberto. Roberto, he's Italian, but he lives uh, in Switzerland. And so I came from South Korea. So if you want to just turn on the video for a moment, just to say hello, <laughs> I really appreciate that. Okay. Thank you. 
So, uh, Beatrice, would you like to make some questions? Any questions? Uh, uh, first, uh, first, I want to uh, to um, thanks a lot because finally it's a, a very real um, gender uh, attention. So it's uh, I think uh, uh, girls are really involved in this kind of. Uh, activity and uh, I love it uh, really. And uh, just a question: so there is the computer that is talking, not oh, yes, as, yes. How we, we we can transform our because we using the mobile. In fact, as Adel uh, suggested, uh, it can uh, um, provide a sound. But how we, we can do a sound with microbit? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when I first started the project, the microbit did not have a speaker, um, which is actually why I reached out to Biao to talk to him about um, MP3 support because there's some kind of like uh, libraries that people have built and I was considering building kind of like an add-on board to the microbit so that the speaker could be completely on the device. Um, it's a little bit tricky because now there are um, devices that Arduino has been building, for example, that support TinyML, which is essentially a form of um, supporting machine learning on embedded devices. So if you want to, for example, run your machine learning model on the device itself, you can use something like these new Arduino boards. Um, and uh, I have not actually experimented with that as of yet. Um, I know that the new microbit has speakers and it's possible um, to be able to play the audio. Uh, I know people are doing some, um, some development to play back like more rich audio. A lot of um, the built-in examples right now are more like tonal, so like beeping noises versus like speech, which is um, kind of uh, a little, little bit more intensive in terms of um, memory and also just uh, uh, playback. But, um, one of the things that has been kind of a requirement because of using the microbit at this point is um, having kind of the machine learning model running in the browser external from the device. Although I've definitely seen people start to experiment, for example, with edge impulse to be able to run machine learning models on the microbit itself. Um, I think there's a really interesting opportunities to consider how much of it can be embedded on the toys so and you wouldn't need for it to be connected to the computer at all. That would be a really great direction. But those are some like examples of tools that I know of that can potentially support that at this point. Um, but I haven't seen it kind of like combined all together, especially in the context of like wanting to run it on a toy and not connect something like large, like a mobile device to it. Um, I think I still think something like, for example, a small Arduino or a microbit is really um, the ideal size for that type of application. Okay. Yun um, Shanky Jung, would you like to ask something? Um, I have a question, Eloisa. Okay, sure. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much, Tiffany, for for your presentation, and it was it was fantastic. I'm a teacher, and uh, my question is about uh, special education needs. Mm -hmm. So you do you plan to, uh, or have you already used your tool with special education needs children and special with, uh, for, for children with autism? Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately, at this point, we have not tested with any um, children with special needs. Um, I'd love to kind of hear from you if anything stood out to you as being things to kind of reconsider or think about expanding or uh, redesigning in order to support a broader range of um, kids using the tool. Um, but uh, I don't want to like suppose anything in particular because we haven't tried it out with um, that community of students. So I'd love to learn from you about um, your initial impressions of things that uh, you think could make the tool potentially more approachable. Okay, thank you.
Uh, just a, a small question, if you don't mind. Like, uh, I had uh, like a couple of years ago, I in a children's museum, I built a, a workshop for the kids uh, with embedded, uh, where we were like learning together how to make, um, you know, um, uh, LED embedded slippers, like where you press a button, then you know it. It, a light is uh, emitted and then the children get excited like okay yes I can operate the light with a switch and a sensor and a battery so uh, anyway at home in a home like environment where there is not much things to do uh, can I extend that like you know using this kind of a setup micro bit to kind because I saw at one of the previous slides Tiffany mentioned like sewn uh, electronics is what you were talking about to kind of do this kind of thing. So any idea like we can extend it, say for example, like a, a toddler is walking, right? With a slipper like that. And the slipper gives an acknowledgement, hey, uh, like great walking, like they're learning walking. So something like that, you know, recording the voice and giving it back to the kid. Can we do that? Yeah, uh, I could definitely imagine, for example, like, strapping a hair tie or rubber band around your ankle and attaching the micro bit and recording samples of different types of like kicking or like yeah. foot movement gestures and then triggering sounds. So yeah, you can definitely do that and um, try doing that with Plus Palette as it is now. Sure. Um, I think in terms of like adding LEDs or other types of sensors, it isn't something that is currently supported in the tool. And um, I think a big part of that is um, I, really wanted to consider what you can do just out of the box with the micro bit. Um, and so that's why right now all everything is specifically around movement and sound. Um, sure. Uh, so uh, it could be interesting to kind of consider other types of um, ways to use other sensors or actuators with the micro bit. Um, but at the, at the moment, um, yeah, it doesn't currently support that. Okay, sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe Tiffany, like a, as a sort of maybe the input might be uh, more uh, connected, um, limited to the micro bit at the moment. But um, you want to, uh, if you're, if you could talk about a little bit about your excursion with the uh, scratch, um, connecting it to the scratch. So Tiffany was um, oh yeah then, like, yeah sure exploring with the output, different output, so that kids can see it in the different ways. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the things that I had been um, starting to prototype, and if anyone here actually has expertise in like um, uh, kind of like web communication, I think I need to use WebRTC, and I don't know anything about that word. <laughs> but essentially, um, one thing I was imagining was um, right now the output for um, plush file is sound through the computer. Um, what if kids could, for example, design custom backdrops or stages for their projects. So um, one example that I kind of put together really quickly was like having a stuffed animal go to sleep or wake up and have like the sunset come up behind it or uh, go down. And you can imagine like connecting it to scratch would enable a lot of other types of like visual output as well as sound. Um, so that's something I, I would really love to explore in building the custom scratch extension. But that uh, building a scratch is just quite new to me. And if anyone has experience with that, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, so I think that could definitely expand the types of creative possibilities in the project. Thank you. So when King, Sasha, feel free to ask questions, please. OK. I. For now, I don't have questions, just I want to research for more information and know more about this because this is new for me. Um, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the PlushPal website is, it's the tool itself is open source. So and if anyone wants to use it, it's, it's free to use and um, you could also look at the source code if you're interested as well in technically how it's implemented. Um, but we have a guide and I will link that here in the chat 
um, that has kind of more detailed instructions for how to get started. It's also linked from the Postgres site. So that's the best place to go if you are interested in learning more about how to try out the tool um, yourself. I'm just watching the, it's a very detailed uh, uh, description now to, to do that. It's very, very, thank you very much. Oh, no problem. I hope it's useful. And um, also, I, I don't know if Heloise can share like contact information for myself or Unico, but um, I'm very happy to talk to anyone if they um, have any questions, you know, they think of outside of this, this uh, meetup and uh, feel free to reach out if you uh, have any questions. Adele, is also, it's very interesting to, to teach physics uh, with uh, uh, children of uh, in um, 15, 60 years old. Now, Roberto also, it, it, it teaches um, physics, I think. Hello, Mohana. <laughs> Because I, I saw the children that are um, analyzing the, 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 the wave and they uh, mm. are recognizing patterns. It's so important that even in this early stage age. Right. Yeah, when you brought up 15 to 16 year olds too, like even though we've been doing these workshops and around storytelling and plus choice, you could really just use it for any motion. So mm -hmm. like some fun examples I've seen with this movie involved, for example, building a magic wand that can respond to the movements of um, uh, just like a, a stick. So um, something like that could totally be supported in this tool as well. So it doesn't have to be stuff animals. And I think that could potentially like um, make it a little bit more relevant for older audiences, like high school age um, students, if they Mm -hmm. um, want to experiment with gesture and machine learning. I was actually talking to a um, um, physical education teacher the other day, and mm. she was talking like she was working with a little bit older kids, but like she was talking about how all the um, you know sports um, sports events were canceled, and so she was using some other uh, means to um, have kids practice dance and other type of activities and mm. this might be flash well, might be like if they put yeah. in a wrist or something and they can do a certain movement mm. and make a sound when they're when they do a physical dancing or that would be kind of interesting mm. yeah. uh, excuse me uh, simon long uh, is saying that maybe i would try m5 stack Mm -hmm. uh, do you know that? Yeah. I, I have no idea. What I actually that. It's just did really... experiment. I experimented with using the M5 stick when I first started this project um, because I thought the built in speaker would be a really nice um, kind of uh, way to be able to embed more of the project on the, the toy itself. Um, but I decided to use the um, micro bit because I think the M5 stick has a little bit less kind of. Uh, popularity, especially in like North America. Um, and I think when I experimented with it, it was a little bit finicky in terms of programming, it's like it's a little bit um, less accessible, I think, to beginners than the micro bit. So um, I do think that, yeah, there's lots of really great devices and different tools that could support this type of like just data collection around the solometer. Um, but uh, as an initial start, I decided to pick the micro bit because is a bit um, more kind of popular and widely used and um, a little bit easier for uh, people to get started with as beginners. Okay, thank you. Um, Samuel Sovan King, would you like to say something? Or who else? Uh, Anders? I want to say something else, sorry. Sure. I, I, I wanted to ask about your experience about uh, uh, with teachers, uh, because uh, in this project, you are introducing two, uh, two main uh, subjects, I think. You have like embedded system and microcontrollers, all this world. 
and the world of artificial intelligence. And you are doing this in just one hour, in one session. So uh, mm -hmm. how was the experience with the teachers, especially primary school teachers? And how did you select them? How was the experience with the teacher? How was their feedback? Uh, did you ask them, for example, if they are ready to use these kind of technologies in their classroom? Uh, this, this is my, my, my question. And I, have, I, will, I will tell you something later. I guess the um, elementary school teachers that we worked with was from Japan. I guess uh, we haven't we haven't um, worked with so many. Um, half of the teachers we we um, Tiffany tested with was museum educators, but um, there are a couple of ed elementary school teachers in the Japanese educators community that we tr tried with, um, but. In general, there are also a uh, sort of teachers who are interested in programming education and other th other things as well. So that um, I found it was surprisingly surprisingly smooth that they were uh, able to sort of understand the platform after like a very only a few, couple of minutes of introduction. And it, the platform itself was pretty intuitive. We found we haven't tried it. Um, we haven't had them try in their classroom yet. Um, but um, that was my impression. What, uh, what yeah. do you think, Tiffany? So to give a little bit of context, all of the teachers that we tried it out with had a micro bit. So they weren't necessarily like beginners to the micro bit in the way that many of the kids were. Um, and so we are interested. So over the summer, we're going to be doing a workshop in collaboration with the micro bit foundation and a lot of the um, teachers that uh, are going to be part of that may not necessarily have used the microbit before that workshop. So I think that'll give us a really good opportunity to kind of see um, more generally how people um, understand and uh, can think about how to introduce the accelerometer in new ways. Um, I do think that there were definitely some things that we identified that um, could be kind of challenging for people to understand a cellular data more generally. So for example, when we're asking people to debug um, kind of conflicting predictions, like they expected the machine learning model to think that they were doing one thing and actually thought they were doing another. Um, that in the ways that they were debugging, there were some examples where people thought that, for example, if like the X and Y accelerometer readings were overlapping, that that would be a problem. But machine learning is actually more of a question of how similar the samples are to one another versus how similar, for example, individual measurements within a sample are. So like if the X and Y are overlapping, it's not a problem unless it conflicts with another sample. Uh, this would be easier to describe visually, I suppose. But I think that there's still a lot of opportunity to think about like how do we introduce the graphing, like the X, Y, Z. And that's something I really want to think about. Like how do you make that more approachable? Because I think like um, it's kind of non-obvious. Like what, what does it mean for something to be three-dimensional? Like what direction do I have to move it in for those three dimensions to be like um, more transparent to me, um, to my understanding of how the microbit works. So if any anyone has ever like had uh, experience kind of Introducing the accelerometer in more approachable ways, I think we're interested in that. Um, I didn't answer all of your questions. I think, um, yeah, so we have tested with teachers that already have a micro bit. So that part of like introducing embedded systems outside of machine learning was maybe like not so much of an issue for these teachers because they were more new to machine learning rather than new to the micro bit. But we are hoping to do some more uh, workshops with teachers um, to see how to make both aspects of that workshop more understandable. I just wanted to, 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 to tell you why I was asking this. We had a presentation before about introducing AI to primary school teachers. I think in, mm. uh, in Korea, we were speaking. And we had one teacher from, from Japan, I think it's Hajimu, right? Uh, I forgot. Yes, yes. Hajime. And, and yes. And what he said, I mean, after seeing all the presentation and what, I mean, we want as teachers to teach to kids, he said it's too much for the teachers. 
uh, I think you you want to teach them scratch, you want to teach them artificial intelligence, and I think we have your project microbit and so on. So my I, uh, 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 now I have a concern when we introduce a new technology. It's not mm -hmm. about the kids because I know that the kids they will learn very quickly, but how to introduce these uh, kind of technologies yeah. to teachers in a very smooth way. And what I loved yeah. in your 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 presentation is that you are not talking about uh, when you see your uh, the name of the presentation is storytelling. So basically, you are not telling them that they are learning about artificial intelligence in the beginning or uh, embedded the systems. So basically, it's appealing, I think. So when you say, oh, it's storytelling, oh, it's, it's good. it should be like uh, uh, fine. It's not, it's not that scary, do you mm. understand? So, but this point for me is like an extremely important point, how to deal with the teachers, mm. uh, especially, you know, when they don't have any background in computing and so on, and you, you want to teach them these kind of high yeah. uh, top technologies. I also think that using dynamic time mapping as an algorithm and the type of model we're using without getting into the details of it um, is actually very amenable to understanding what the computer is seeing and trying to um, use to detect patterns. Because if you think about like neural networks, often there are like many, many layers of a neural network and it's very hard to understand like exactly what features or like what parts of the movement are, is the computer using to make its predictions. Whereas like when you're using um, nearest neighbors, the algorithm that we're using here, you can visually inspect and see like how close does this look to another one? And somehow I think that makes it a lot more transparent as to what's happening and also easier for people that are beginning to kind of get started because you're looking you're looking at visual differences. And I think that um, also makes it a little bit more approachable even if you never like, played around with the solar array data before, but it's definitely something we want to further test. Yeah, and then we haven't really taken the time to really sort of make sure that we take time to really reflect on how they understood about the platform itself. So, and then that Flashpal is a wonderful tool that as Tiffany explained, it's like visualizing what's going on in the box. So I think it will be interesting. I can imagine like having a session with the teachers uh, to sort of not start with the what's, what's machine learning, but like start with uh, really intuitively engaging with it and then perhaps like step back and reflect on like what's going on, why is it not working? And we found that that sort of that questioning of why is it not working? Why do you think it's confused? Um, is so generative to introduce some of the ideas that are um, not necessarily easy to grasp when you are being explained. I would say, that you have many challenges and men, we, we could um, focus in focuses in different talks, this amazing presentation and this amazing research. You are in the very beginning of the something that most of the people in the, in the world doesn't know what is it about. We are specialists and you are here for learning. I see the workshop you did with the professors in Japan they are all very, very, people I know they are very specialists on microbits. They can do that in 15 minutes. I, I think because they are used to have a microbit and think, doing makers stuff. But we see that it's not uh, the general reality. Because, for example, here in Brazil, we don't have computers at the schools, public schools. Of course, it's different problems, different situations. But the good thing is, is you are in the front line, discovering, researching, and doing the first experiments in this line to teach the others that coming uh, after. So that's wonderful. Uh, Eloisa, Elo but this is, is for everything in technology. I mean, 
Yes. In United Ki- in United Kingdom, they have uh, no every child has has a, a, a micro bit. Uh, yes. So uh, this is the big uh, issue of uh, the big gap between uh, countries. Sure, and but that's very interesting because we have this uh, front line. Then we have the teachers, the specialists. Then we have the school teachers, and then we have the rest of the world. So, and then we can, I could say a lot of things about the psychology or neurophysiology or things like that, about the process, what would be happening in the brain of the child when they have this situation, how they are connected psychology is emotionally connected to their puppies, puppets, um, and so on. It's a wonderful landscape to, to study, to research, and to learn. So I would like to congratulate you both and all the who works because it's very, very for the chance to share. Thank you so much. It was really amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Chifan, and bye bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.